Thank you. So such a warm welcome to um, all our speakers and our guests today. We have a fabulous event, um, not our usual lecture, but we are here to celebrate um, the launch of Laura von Ostrowski's new book. It's her monograph, A Text in Motion, The Yoga Sutra as a Practice Element in Ashtanga Yoga, a historical, religious, aesthetic and eth ethnographic study. So the SOAF Centre of Yoga Studies is delighted to be hosting this event, um, and we've actually hosted a few such book launches so far. Um, my name is Ruth Westerby, and I'm very honoured to be chairing this evening's event. I'd like to say a few words about Laura um, and some of her forthcoming publications, and then I'm going to introduce the respondents that we have this evening uh, and tell you a little bit about the, the format of this evening's event. So Laura von Ostrowski studied Indology, Religious Studies and Romance Studies at LMU Munich from 2015 to 2018. She was a fellow of the DFG Research Training Group Presence and Implicit Knowledge at FAU Erlangen Nuremberg and received her PhD in Religious Studies from LMU in 2021. For the open access publication of the book based on her thesis, A Text in Motion, she was funded by Open Publishing in the Humanities. Her areas of research include modern and contemporary yoga, the reception of the Yoga Sutra, the history of German yoga and of the physical culture movement, contemporary religion, aesthetics and embodiment. So unfortunately for me, I do not speak German and the book is published in German, which is a fantastic um, diversity point, I think we are so, the, the hegemony of having to publish in English can be quite frustrating, but it does put me on the back foot here a little bit. But I am very grateful that Laura has got forthcoming publications in English, which I have been able to look at before this evening's event. So, and for the benefit of other poor people like me who only speak English, we have, um, Laura has a, um, a co-authored publication coming out with Lena, who is also speaking this evening, entitled Embodied Neo-Spirituality, as an experience filter from dance and movement practice to contemporary yoga, which is going to be published in Body and Religion by Equinox um, and should be coming out later this year. Um, and Laura is also for, shortly to be publishing a piece called Practicing the Yoga Sutra, an approach to the analysis of contemporary yoga philosophy's somatic as aspects. That's going to appear in Nut Jacobson and Henriette Hankey's um, and Istvan Kuhl's uh, edited volume on practices of embodied reception, South Asian spiritualities in contemporary contexts, probably coming out next year. Um, however, uh, Laura has already uh, presented a lecture for the SOAS Center of Yoga Studies, and that will be available through our YouTube channel, so you can check out some of her work there. And I was really pleased to recently hear her presenting on her research at the Krakow Conference YDYS 2022. And actually, I also heard her speak at the YDYS Krakow Conference in, what was it, 2016, um, at the, I suppose, earliest, earlier stages of this research project. Um, I think that I have a slightly odd positionality here in chairing this event because I'm an Ashtanga practitioner and that is the, um, the data set, the, the field study that um, Laura is working with in this group. So I, I, I've sort of got a little bit of a vortex of odd things going on for me as I kind of come from a, a more textual studies scholarly approach but yet have this practitioner background. So I find her research fascinating and incredibly timely. I think it's hugely important that we have such serious um, and considered treatments of, of this material. I would, however, give a trigger warning at this stage because since Laura started her work, and as many of you are perhaps aware, um, uh, the abuse within Ashtanga Yoga has been more widely publicized. And I'm offering it as just trigger warning now in case it comes up um, in some of our respondents uh pieces or it comes up in the in the more open discussion at the end so i'm very excited to introduce all of our respondents for this evening and i'm going to just give all your bios now so that once you start speaking we can kind of move through you without me having to in interrupt so we have dr philip mars to start with who is currently a research associate at the institute for indology and central asian studies at the university of leipzig 
His research centers around South Asian cultural, religious, and philosophical history, with a special emphasis on the early classical and classical period, including early classical Ayurveda, pre-classical and classical Sankhya Yoga, classical Nyaya philosophy from various perspectives and with various methods, as well as the methodologies of text genealogy, textual criticism and editorial techniques. So I think it will be very interesting to get his kind of take on Laura's work from a slightly different methodological position. We'll then hear from Dr. Beatrix Hauser, who is a senior lecturer at the University of Bremen. Her research centers around the anthropology of the body and religion, performance studies, gender, transcultural flows and entanglements, and South Asia. And I'm very much looking forward to her contribution um, as she has done it's sort of um, a lot of research that sits so closely and nicely with the work that Laura is doing. Finally, and I'm very sorry if I do terrible pronunciation of your surname here, Lena, Dr. Lena Ashenbrenner will be speaking. Um, she has published, she has co-authored with Laura, and she's a postdoctoral fellow at the Religious Studies Department at the University of Erfurt in Germany. Her research centers around bodies and embodiment, aesthetics, affects, and experience, and the critical study of religion. So now I will hand over to Philip Moss. Thank you so much. Yes, uh, thank you very much, uh, Ruth, for um, introducing me and for uh, sharing this session. Uh, many thanks also to the um, um, uh, Center for Yoga Studies at SOAS for um, providing the opportunity to, to launch this uh, book. And of course, uh, most of all, congratulations to Laura for uh, writing this, uh, I think, very uh, important book in the field of uh, modern yoga studies. So it was a, a real pleasure for me uh, to, to read this book, um, a book with a, a very, very apt title, uh, text uh, in motion, and uh, both uh, um, nouns that this title feature uh, I think are, are very uh, wisely chosen uh, for uh, Laura's book. First of all, we are uh, dealing uh, with, with a text. So Laura is not uh, talking about a, a certain work, but a text. A uh, text, as we know, is a sequence uh, of words. And in, in this uh, context here, it refers to the Yoga Sutra, which, uh, as uh, um, I have argued earlier, is an extraction from a more comprehensive work um, the Patanjala Yoga Shastra, that is uh, the Yoga Sutra together with the Yoga Vasha. So this extract, the, the Yoga Sutra has, uh, um, is described as being in motion and we are, uh, this aspect of motion also uh, features prominently in a book in many respects, not only because it took me on a, a personal journey, a very entertaining one, uh, telling a story of uh, adaptation, uh, change, uh, and uh, distortion. Uh, one, one could argue that uh, nobody could invent, actually, uh, if uh, it would be a, a work of fiction. So um, history here uh, was more creative than any human mind uh, could have uh, been. So um, the, the aspect of motion, of course, uh, is the motion um, through space uh, and time. Um, the uh, time aspect uh, is uh, relevant with regard to a work that was composed around the year 400 of the Common Era uh, in the, uh, at the time of the Gupta Era in uh, what is called Classical South Asia. Um, work, with, work which is an update, so to say, of an uh, ancient uh, philosophical system of uh, Sankhya that had become under pressure uh, from um, the side of Buddhism. Sankhya and Buddhism shared uh, discourses about spiritual liberation. Um, they all were also struggling for uh, support uh, from, uh, from rulers. They had to uh, stand um, in philosophical uh, debates. They had to prove their arguments. And uh, this uh, setting of argumentation has led to the refinement of philological, uh, philosophical arguments um, which has framed what may be called Indian uh, philosophy in its uh, specific uh, outline. Um, a philosophy which is uh, underrepresented in uh, Western academic studies, but uh, clearly deserves um, a place within uh, world history. 
And yeah, th this work, which uh, itself is uh, a kind of hybrid, uh, um, um, hybrid um, creation, combining different uh, streams uh, of thought uh, under um, an umbrella which is uh, framed by um, Brahmanical uh, um, hegemony in society, the idea um, of um, a stratified society in uh, several classes, um, and the, on the head of which we find uh, the Brahmanas uh, together with the uh, next uh, two classes of society, which uh, de uh, designate themselves uh, as Aryas. A religion which was um, um, used as a center of their identity, a corpus of knowledge, um, a, a corpus of religious knowledge, the Veda, which has nothing to do with spiritual liberation and the striving for spiritual liberation that we uh, find at the center of the Patanjali Vashastra. So this uh, work then uh, was uh, very successful. It um, um, was uh, could claim to be the authoritative exposition uh, for the striving of spiritual liberation. It was viewed in this way for many, many hundred uh, years within South Asia. It was adopted uh, in, in poetry. Um, it was then later on um, also um, um, separated from its uh, original philosophical uh, background, uh, transferred into a new system of uh, Advaita Vedanta, um, and then uh, in modernity, um, it, um, yeah, it, it played a role for Krishna Macharya, who um, then uh, invented Ashtanga Yoga by combining uh, many uh, different uh, um, currents of thoughts, uh, Hatha Yoga, uh, ideas of physical fitness. All this is very aptly uh, described uh, by uh, Laura in her book uh, on the basis uh, mainly of um, secondary uh, literature, uh, yeah, which she covers uh, uh, very, very uh, nicely. A couple of things have uh, um, struck me when, when I read uh, this book as a particularly um, note noteworthy. Um, the first thing is um, the idea of uh, yoga philosophy, which is uh, so central uh, to Laura's book, the idea that it's possible um, to um, physically practice uh, an ancient India Shastra or an extraction of an in, uh, Indian uh, Shastra uh, integrated into a physical uh, regime and into uh, to create a, a lifestyle on the basis of this text, which uh, yeah, is um, a very, very innovative uh, approach which goes uh, ahead, of course, with uh, sacrificing uh, some uh, aspects uh, of uh, philosophy that I would, uh, as an academic, um, uh, view as quite central uh, to philosophy. Uh, the, the first uh, aspect, of course, of, of, of philosophy that comes to my mind is a, a kind of structured reasoning for which it's important to create a consistent academic language, a terminology that has to be used to talk about the things that we are um, discussing in a systematic way, and which was, of course, uh, uh, very central uh, to Indian philosophy as it was uh, to European philosophy. But uh, in the process of transition, this aspect of philosophy uh, apparently got lost, and uh, yoga philosophy in the um, context of Ashtanga yoga became what people thought about the applicability, applicability of uh, the Yoga Sutra to their life, um, discussions uh, among practitioners about uh, how to um, interpret uh, the, the text according to their own standing, to their own uh, uh, personal uh, perspective. And th that's a huge uh, democratization, but one could also maybe say uh, in some degree, a trivialization of uh, philosophy. Um, not only um, because um, the um, terminology, um, the um, ability to speak in a structured way about um, um, the topics of uh, philosophy uh, has got lost uh, in this way, but also because um, I think a uh, general approach to rationality uh, has, has shifted um, considerably. So Patanjali Yoga was uh, very much committed to uh, um, debating the aspects um, 
yeah, the, the, the individual uh, disciplines of philosophy like uh, epistemology, uh, ethics, um, um, metaphysics, yeah, all these things uh, were there in an open uh, sphere to say where uh, philosophers from uh, different angles uh, put their um, put their uh, philosophical views out there, uh, and they did this in a certain medium in a certain language, and this language uh, was uh, Sanskrit. Um, so, uh, what what is the meaning of, uh, of of Sanskrit of the Sanskrit of the Patanjali Yoga Shastra for modern yoga uh, practitioners, and uh, especially for the uh, Ashtanga Yoga uh, innovation uh, as it was uh, practiced by and, and taught by. Um, um, Ronald Steiner, um, and, and that was something that that struck me as a philologist uh, completely. So that it's possible, uh, so to say, to create a new, completely new meaning to invent the Yoga Sutra um, uh, in in a new way without any having without having any knowledge about uh, the history or uh, of uh, knowledge of the language. And I would like to. Uh, briefly uh, provide one example that is Patanjali Yoga Shastra 247, um, the Yoga Sutra, uh, which uh, runs like Prayatna Shaitirya Anantya Samapati Vyam. This is given a reason for how um, asana practice uh, becomes, um, becomes uh, firm, uh, steady, and comfortable because of two aspects, uh, uh, um, the relaxation of effort and a certain meditation. And uh, there's no doubt that uh, if you know it's Sanskrit, that this is uh, the meaning uh, of this uh, of this passage. And I have argued uh, uh, in favor of this interpretation in an article, Stira Sukham Asana, Posture and Performance in Classical Yoga and Beyond. And I was so su su surprised to see that uh, without any further ado, Steiner renders this as essential for this practice is a uniformly soft breath, payatna, breath. Uh, so uh, the word for effort here becomes breath, as well, abhyam, and that's the dual ending uh, in Sanskrit, uh, becoming a word of, uh, on its own right, um, as well as the snakish hissing of breath, ananta. So we have two different words for breath here. One is payatna which uh, uh, means effort, and the other one then is uh, um, uh, the name of a, a mythical snake or, in the better reading, uh, infinity. So that's, of course, a complete uh, distortion of uh, what's going on uh, in Patanjali Yoga, and I uh, found this uh, fascinating. And it's a question of, uh, yeah, philosophical question arises, the impossibility, as, uh, as uh, had been argued by Wittgenstein, of the invention of a private language which comes into play here and uh, uh, how it is possible uh, to claim authority for such an interpretation uh, and to build uh, the position of a teacher. And this leads me to the last point that I once, uh, want to make, namely the relationship between yoga and politics, which don't play uh, actually a, a role in Laura's book, but I think is an important aspect for future research, namely which role did the Patanjali Yoga Shastra play throughout history uh, for the maintenance of uh, political structure, of uh, power structures, and which role does modern yoga play for the preservation of our uh, late modern uh, uh, capitalist uh, society. Thank you very much. Thank you ever so much, Philip. Brilliant practice, uh, questions for future research. Fabulous. Please may I hand over to Dr. Beatrix Hazer. Yeah, well, Many thanks for organizing this event. And of course, again, congratulations to Laura for her uh, very inspiring uh, book and study. Uh, before I begin, let me say a few words about my perspective on Laura's book. I'm, as Ruth uh, said, I'm trained as a social anthropologist, but I also studied modern Indian languages a long time ago. So I not only appreciate an interdisciplinary approach, I also know how difficult it can be to satisfy readers from diverse backgrounds. After doing fieldwork and research on Hindu practices for the most of my academic life, my interest had shifted to the transcultural yoga world with its selective forms of cultural appropriation, acts of framing and reframing, 
as well as the creation of new elements identified with or rather imagined somehow as Indian yoga. So my current research looks at the mutual influences of health seeking behavior and spiritual aspirations. So similar to Laura, I focus on postural yoga as a social site where subjective bodily experiences are linked with specific cultural meanings. On this background, I really appreciate an ethnography that shows empirically how yoga practitioners recognize particular somatic states and discourses as spiritual or, in my words, in religious ways. And Laura's book shows in a paradigmatic way how a textual source like the Yoga Sutra is given authoritative status to create a kind of practical ethics termed by Laura as, I quote, contemporary yoga philosophy, end of quote. So in the following, I will look at Laura's work through the lens of a critical ethnographer and explore those sections of her work which are based on fieldwork, which is of course only a part of this, uh, of her volume. So the location chosen by her for her fieldwork is part of today's global Astanga yoga network. Laura became a participant observer and collected data during an advanced teacher training course run by a German sports physician, Dr. Ronald Steiner. Steiner was trained by BKS Ayenga and by Padabi Joish before he developed, I quote, Astanga Yoga Innovation, end of quote, a specific program for which he reserved a trademark. Um, sorry, something is wrong here. Here we are. Um, so part of this advanced level syllabus uh, is named yoga philosophy. In this part, Steiner, a thoroughly trained athlete, explains to the next generation of yoga teachers how to read, recite, and understand the Yoga Sutra framed as a source text to consider the eight limbs of yoga. The databases of Laura's study includes 36 hours of audio recordings from this teacher training qualitative interviews with four yoga teachers and experts in their field, and with four participants. Apart from Laura's own field notes, she had access to personal notes of eight co-students. These data were gathered during 2015 to 19 and evaluated with reference to the grounded theory method. I mention these features because they hint at both the tremendous value of her study to modern yoga studies, the anthropology of the body, and the study of religion in the social sciences, but also to weak spot. Against the background of earlier publications on postural yoga and spirituality, the benefits are clear. Laura's book provides the empirical basis for present day social practices where first of all, physical techniques of self-care, in this case, postural yoga, are combined and, legitim and legitimized with a multitude of promises, ethics, and calls to action. Moreover, she offers emic categories that help circumvent the debate on spiritual but not religious issues, and at best, contributes to name and conceptualize the subtle processes and dynamics of framing subjective experience as spiritually meaningful. Laura applies the analytic terminology used by Anne Koch, a historian of religion, to describe various somatic processes evoked and created by Ashtanga Yoga and probably similar forms of postural yoga. Moreover, she shows how the Yoga Sutra is appropriated in Germany and related to personal everyday experiences, identifying distinct ways of how seemingly Indian knowledge is connected with asana routine, 
somatic experience and the enchanting aura of, of Sanskrit. Not surprisingly, and uh, Philip already gave an example, these processes bring about meanings of their own. Far off any type of Yoga Sutra exegesis in previous epochs and contrasting cultural contexts. Laura argues that contemporary yoga philosophy focuses on and practically relates to four broad issues. At first, self discovery. At second, pro social behavior. Third, achieving emphatic states of consciousness, like the here and now mental focus, peace of mind, flow, and four, care for an embodied divinity understood as a fundamental psychophysical transformation. Considering that the yoga philosophy is conveyed solely with the help of German Yoga Sutra translations, it is remarkable how Sanskrit terminology is taken up as a lingua franca of a global and seemingly shared yogic cosmos, suggesting both an inherent audible sacredness and a new terminology to describe late modern aspirations and spiritual seeking. In this respect, we could speak not only of Guru English, as Srinivas Aramudan suggested in 2006, to describe the transformation of originally South Asian vocabulary in the global realm, but of Guru Sanskrit, thereby indicating the discrepancy between meaning production by the pre-modern Brahmin elite and conversely, today's saviors around the world. In the mentioned case study, for instance, Samadhi is identified as a synonym for the concept of flow, coined by the psychologist Mihaly Chikchen Mihaly in the 1970s. This brings me to a critical point in Laura's ethnography, or at least a point I thought about. Her book is packed with Sanskrit vocabulary. The transcription follows common Indological standards. This is, in my view, ambiguous. It certainly proves Laura's Indological expertise, yet it comes at a price. Um, the text passages, where it remains unclear whether Laura uses these terms as analytic categories for her own argument, or at other passages, she uses it as, rep as a representation of emic jargon both levels intermingle, and the emic jargon seems to be basically anglicized. So one could get the impression that adding diacritics to field jargon contributes to, new, contributes to the universalizing or essentializing discourse within the yoga world, as if there would be only like one type of samadhi. Is there any ahistorical meaning of samadhi? No. Strictly speaking, semantics are inherently time and context sensitive. Similarly, I would treat the frequent references to Patanjali in the teacher training course as a fifth broad issue of constructing yoga philosophy, namely the invention of a continuous history of reception and text exegesis following the Protestant narrative of sola scriptura. In other words, I would have found it more convincing if Laura had analyzed the discursive links to Patavish Jewish and Krishnamacharya as a result of her ethnographic study rather than at its opening. However, anybody who aimed for a PhD knows how formal decisions are taken also to satisfy supervisors and refuse. In case of an interdisciplinary thesis, a particularly balancing act. One another point might be a challenge for a PhD candidate. Although Laura introduced her study with a chapter on the state of research, which is absolutely um, illuminating, towards the end of her book, she missed the chance to position her findings in the field of modern yoga study. 
in what respect does her ethnography reflect general developments in the yoga world? I mean, beyond this specific teacher training course, beyond Astanga yoga, or beyond Germany. Maybe I didn't read carefully enough. Uh, at any rate, I would have loved to find in the conclusions some critical views on current forms of conceptualizing and theorizing yoga spirituality. Um, and just a suggestion, Elliot Goldberg's book on the development of modern yoga from, I quote, divesting yoga of the sacred, end of quote, to, I quote, making yoga sacred again, end of quote, would have been a nice choice for a comparison. Thank you. And uh, sorry for being a bit critical. <laughs> Laura, I really appreciate your work. Thank you. Thanks ever so much, Beatrix. Dr. has some really fascinating points on the use of language. Brilliant. Um, before I introduce our final discussant, may I or, um, encourage everybody to use the uh, Slido function to post any questions for any of the discussants or for Laura. So put it in the chat and I'll repost it in a second. It's a different website you need to go to, put in the code and then you can write your questions there. And if you put your name in, we'll be able to come to you and, uh, and ask you to uh, read your questions out loud. Okay, so Dr. Ashen Brenner, over to you. Yes, uh, good evening. Um, I think uh, I will start my response also by stating uh, uh, that I have read and value the book of my colleague Laura as a cultural studies study of religion scholar with a focus on aesthetics or in other words on material and lived religion and as a scholar with a focus on senses, bodies, embodiment and enactment. I am myself researching neo-spiritualities uh, centered, centering on what is commonly called uh, dance, such as the Israeli practice Gaga or global Hawaiian hula. Now, um, a text in Bewegung, a text in motion, is a very encompassing and detailed study of the entanglement of contemporary yoga practice with sensory bodily involvement yoga philosophy and the yoga sutra. Um, the book depicts how the contemporary discourse and phenomenon yoga and its sub-discourses and sub-phenomena of modern yoga philosophy and the yoga sutra are shaped by a network of texts, body strategies alongside yoga philosophy strategies, the yoga practitioner's bodies and the practitioner's embodied experiences. In her book, uh, Laura shows very clearly that a discourse or a phenomenon like yoga, yoga philosophy, or even the discourse on a text such as the Yoga Sutra is negotiated and anchored in dispositives of multidimensional nature. The multidimensional nature corres corresponds with the multiple dimensions of the cultural and social phenomenon yoga itself. It is built on the premise that discourses, dispositives, and phenomena are composed of different heterogeneous components. The material as well as immaterial, the semantic as well as non-semantic, the explicit and conscious as well as the implicit and unconscious. This is, of course, not unique to yoga, yet in Laura's very specific research object, Ashtanga Yoga, the multidimensional nature becomes a defining trait a feature that defines its social and cultural role. Also, here lies the difference between a written text-based exegesis and an aesthetic approach. In the lived and material religion context, in the context of social and cultural impact, a text is only important in its performance, as a text being read, a text being recited, a text being translated, and so on. Aesthetics of religion is dedicated to tracing the sensory mechanisms of practices that result in embodied transformation and therefore transformed culture and social participation of individuals. The title of the book seems to suggest uh, that Laura's book is only partially an aesthetics of religion work. However, I believe the whole book can be understood, understood via the glasses of aesthetics of religion and can be framed as aesthetic research. At every single point of the book, Laura considers multidimensionality, and this is what, in my eyes, defines an aesthetic approach. In the service of her study, um, 
Laura interviews different methods and very different data, primarily written historical sources such as texts, the work of other researchers, primarily written contemporary sources such as ethnographic field notes, but also the homework of yoga trainees, as well as primarily audio sources such as interviews or audio recordings of philosophy sessions. Um, the base of Laura's work forms an ethnographic case study of enacted yoga philosophy in Germany. It is conducted in the context of different yoga practices, mainly the teacher training of Ronald Steiner. Laura uses the concept of body knowledge to name, verbalize, and draw specific attention to those parts of the multiple dimensions which take part on a body level and are still often forgotten in cultural studies. Um, cultural studies analysis. Laura shows that and how the body level matters as an important part of the multidimensional nature. In her written cultural analysis, she includes the body level with ease and sophistication. The book opens the eyes of its readers to what has defined and continu continues to define her research field, multidimensionality, performance, and its embodied effect. Uh, additionally, a detailed look at the aesthetics and the embodiment dynamics of contemporary and historical Ashtanga yoga shows that aesthetics and body knowledge are the place to look for connections between yoga and other body and movement practices. It is the aesthetics which mark contemporary Ashtanga yoga practices as neo-spiritual, and by pointing this out, Laura adds to an alternate view and approach of defining and understanding cultural and social phenomena. It is in the aesthetics where we can find historic consistencies or transformations. Neo spirituality seem characterizable by the accentuation on certain body knowledge, such as we've heard it before, flow or embodied collective effervescence caused by covered imitation or rhythmic synchronization. As other religious practices, neo spirituality is catered to an individual worldview building need. Still, in her book, Laura describes that and how the situation in contemporary Ashtanga yoga is more complex than in other new spiritual practices. Practitioners learn to think the bodily experience directly in yoga philosophy or to in interpret it within the framework of yoga philosophy, on the one hand. On the other hand, yoga philosophy or the text of the Yoga Sutra become relevant to the practitioners only in context with their own body knowledge. This process intersects with post-colonial heritage, uh, such as exotization and othering. And the book uh, underlines um, how part of the aesthetic value of the Yoga Sutra and the embodied effect and worldview impact is, um, of it is due to the sensory and embodied perception of Sanskrit as exotic and other. And necessarily on this, uh, and not necessarily um, uh, depends on the semantic context of trans, uh, translations and interpretations. Um, finally, uh, I want to point out uh, that Laura's work uh, is, especially in terms of aesthetics of religion, uh, a groundbreaking work. Aesthetics are multidimensional, aesthetics are sensed, aesthetics are, loc are located on a body level, aesthetics are fleeting. Um, the research of historic aesthetics is a challenge. And in her book, um, Laura demonstrates that and how it is nevertheless possible to access aesthetics in the historical dimension. Based on a diverse and rich material, Laura manages an excellent juxtaposition of historical and contemporary aesthetics and historical and contemporary body strategies that create body knowledge. Um, of the body strategies of Joyce, for example, and those of the yoga promoted by Steiner. This is not an easy undertaking, uh, but a much needed one. Um, some historic developments we can only grasp when we view historic discourses of phenomena in the multidimensional nature. And social and cultural dynamics take place at many levels, but always on the level of the body. Neglecting this body level will always mean neglecting to see the whole picture. So um, ultimately, I conclude this is a book to be read by those interested in yoga, of course. 
but also by those interested in why and how to do body focused cultural and social research. And yes, Laura, um, I'm very much looking forward to your future work. Brilliant. Thanks you ever so much for that contribution. And my hand over to Laura. I congratulate you on the publication of your book. Hi, Ruth. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much. <laughs> First of all, to Ruth for taking over spontaneously this event, for um, chairing this event. Um, thank you <laughs> for your time and everything you did. And um, thanks for everyone who came. Um, all my uh, colleagues and friends and family. I'm so happy that you're here. And um, to the Source Center of Yoga Studies, of course, um, just that you open up this possibility to invite me to launch a German book. I know <laughs> it is um, a bit, I mean, you, you just had very different angles. And that was actually like kind of my plan. That was actually what I wanted to provoke with three different respondents from three very different viewpoints. And I try to kind of talk about that a bit more. So this book is broad and it is in German. And um, it, I guess no one put will put this in Google Translate. So <laughs> thank you for just giving me the chance to um, give a little glimpse into that book in this book launch. Um, so thanks to the Source Center of Yoga Studies for all the work you're doing. and. Um, Last, I would like to thank, because I see some um, people here in the audience that contributed to my work. So there are some people I interviewed, there are some students of the um, formation that I did my research in. And um, yeah, I thank you for listening. And um, I would like to talk about that further afterwards or whatever, um, however, uh, yeah, what kind of um let's say um discussions come out of that i'm i'm very happy about that so just to start with this um like the fascinating thing i mean i'm sitting here you're writing this book for five years alone in your chamber you get some feedback but in german actually you don't get much feedback because the german yoga studies scene is not big so um i i of course read all of uh, english publications and so on but um, now I'm sitting here and the first time people have read my book and they give a lot of input that I now have to respond to. <laughs> That's quite a task. And then I have these differing viewpoints. And the first thing I want to say about my book is um, uh, to kind of respond to Beatrix a bit. Um, I was thinking, how should I do it? Should I do comparative work? Of course, this is common. This is what one usually does. One compares like Veronique Altglas, a very um, um, fascinating research on modern yoga and Kabbalah, for example. And then she comes to conclusions that I also use for my work. So I use these comparative works that have already been written to um, enrich my analysis of my data, because my data was actually just in Germany. It, it was no like, uh, let's say, a cultural comparison in there. And it was no comparison between yoga styles. And in the end, I did that on purpose because what I wanted to do is to research, it's, it was actually an experiment to research one phenomenon that I will I came to call contemporary yoga philosophy in my work, one phenomenon from different angles. So I did ethnographic work, I interviewed a lot of um, practitioners and not only Ronald Steiner as it seemed and his um, um, students, but also um, other teachers from the global Ashtanga yoga scene, five in total, um, that are te senior teachers um, that contributed to, to my data. So I have a kind of global um, spanning in this ethnographic work um, because Ashtanga yoga is a globalized yoga style. Um, but so I have this empirical ethnographic side of, um, let's say, narrative data. But then I also looked at um, the body side. So I looked at um, um, practic practices. So what we do when we research yoga is we look at texts 
which is amazing without philological work which i've also done in my earlier <laughs> in my earlier years academic years um, I wouldn't have been able to write this work. I wouldn't have known anything about the Yoga Sutra or the Patanjali Yoga Shastra um, uh, to, to just call the, the whole text by its full name. Um, but um, uh, or we, we interview, so we, we, we work as ethnographers, but that especially in the field of yoga, the body practices they actually are the biggest part of what modern yoga is. So what I really wanted to do is to include this. So if I would have compared like two cultural approaches to yoga philosophy or whatever, um, I wouldn't have had time or like the chance to go, for example, to the body level. So I really try to, let's say, this was one phenomenon, contemporary yoga philosophy, and I try to look at it at this very prismatic phenomenon from different sides. So that was my project. So I know it can be criticized that um, it was not a, um, let's say, comparative approach. Um, yeah, I will say more to that um, afterwards. But so I have this body level, and then I also have this endological, let's say, um, level of comparing or maybe enriching i don't know modern interpretations um with uh, what we know about um contents uh, of the patanjali yoga shastra what uh, especially philip mars brought forward in this field so yeah i had these different angles and try to somehow i mean what does a empiricist do first like observe that was the starting point describe and then analyze and I try to describe and analyze it from different angles. So we saw Lina very much going to the second part of my book. It is the religious aesthetic part where I really try to see which practices are practiced in Ashtanga Yoga and not only Ashtanga Yoga, but a reformed, modernized Ashtanga Yoga that includes a lot of practices, let's say, of um, yeah, in deep embodiment. And um, so I looked at all these practices um, very thoroughly with these body knowledge categories that Beatrix highlighted to see what is actually happening on the body level in this practice that practitioners do most of their time. And then the observation was what they do on the with their bodies has an impact on how they read yoga philosophy, contemporary yoga philosophy, because of course they not read it in a way that it was uh, meant by whoever wrote the Patanjali Yoga Shastra. So um, this is a, another layer to really look at, okay, what effects do modern, does modern yoga, in this um, case Ashtanga Yoga has? Um, and I hope that I kind of can provide, for example, with these body knowledge categories and with this really look onto the embodied um, aspect of uh, modern yoga and um, to to enrich other studies in other yoga styles in other countries for a comparative approach so they could compare with my um with what i found out so um this is the second chapter and um yeah i mean to the first chapter, it was a historical chapter. So history, then the body level, and afterwards ethnography. So I really tried to kind of look at these different aspects of one yoga style. And I think, um, yeah, Beatrix, it was an interesting point that you made. I'm not sure if I full on understood it because what I tried to show in my historical part is how contemporary yoga philosophy came to be. So I try to show, for example, what Philip highlighted that um, there is the translation of um, Prayatna Shaitilya Ananta Sabhapati Byam as this hissing sound of a snake, um, the interpretation that this could be Ujjayi, this comes from Krishnamacharya. So this is an interpretation that we find in the Krishnamacharya lineage over time. So what I try to reason is that um, yoga philosophy really changed its costume at the beginning of the 20th century, of course, starting with Vivekananda, but in um, practice, practice, body practice oriented lineages like the Krishnamacharya um, lineage is, 
um, there has been kind of a new take on the Yoga Sutra. Um, Krishnamacharya students, for example, Claude Marichal, which I'm quote um, for that, he highlighted that Krishnamacharya changed the Yoga Sutra towards a bhakti interpretation, which we like a Vedantization of the Yoga Sutra took place several centuries earlier. But also, he really tried to mingle it with body practice on and on. So that was something that came from the Krishnamacharya lineage. So I think this historical part is really important to understand why we do have something here in Germany in the 21st century that can be called contemporary yoga philosophy. How did that come to be? It's not, it wasn't just invented by um, some practitioners today. So it somehow has a history. And this is what I try to show um, with historical chapter, really analyzing Krishnamacharya's um, publications um, and then analyzing how Padabi Joyce taught yoga philosophy, talking to his senior students and see um, that there was, for example, a break in um, what Krishnamacharya talked or taught about the Yoga Sutra, even if it was already um, uh, interpretation of Patanjali that was very modern. Okay, yeah, so um, these different views on my work, it's very fascinating. <laughs> and that's what I actually wanted to, to show somehow that, I mean, I try to make an interdisciplinary project on my own. So um, not a comparative, but really to, to, to include different research focuses. And I realized I can talk to Indologists with my work. I can talk to religious aesthetics with my work. I can talk to historians, to anthropologists. I find that interesting. And I hope, I mean, uh, yeah, I hope it's going to foster some good conversations and some um, new research perspectives maybe. Yeah, I think um, that's what I mainly wanted to like answer spontaneously. And um, yeah, so I look forward to whatever questions come and to the discussions. And uh, thank you so much, all the respondents, to read that big book. And maybe one could post before I forget it in the chat, um, the link, maybe I can post it because this book can be downloaded as open access in German, but maybe we can just post that link. So it's just um, everybody knows where it can be found. Thank you. I'll put that link in the chat. I've just put um, the, the bibliographical details for your other two articles in the chat, in the yeah, chat because they were asked for in the questions, but they're not publicly available yet. And I'm sure they will be available on your academia.edu site, if not in other places. Um, so now I'd like to invite all the discussants, if they have any follow up questions, you, you're the guys who have engaged most deeply with Laura's work so far. So and as Laura said, it is such an interdisciplinary work. I mean, this isn't about me, but from, from my kind of perspective of having practiced Ashtanga in London and in Mysore, it's really interesting to see um, the, the, the focus of your work and perhaps to um, follow Beatrix um, re request to sort of see how this work can be more, can be broadened out of that the particular context that you were looking in and um, yeah it's about kind of translocal context as well I, I mean there are so many ways this research could go but I will shut up would the discussants like to have questions for one another or for Laura so we'll do that for 10 minutes or so and then we'll open to questions from the Slido so please do pop your questions there do you have any follow-up questions Philip Lena or Beatrix suggestions for further research. I mean, I think that in your responses, you were very um, nuanced in your observations of the strengths and the, the difficulties of carrying out this sort of research. So where could it go from now? What do you think the research pathways would be most beneficially explored? I think you, you have alluded to this in your responses, but would anybody like to extend that? May I just speak up or do I have to yeah. pull up the mic? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, um, I just wanted to say because um, uh, just maybe also connecting to what Beatrix said. So I think um, uh, it's always a question about structure and how to structure a book like this. And I also see, but it's always the back, like you're always in Germany, du bist schlauer hinterher. So you are you you are you are more intelligent afterwards. So. I think um, 
uh, yes, maybe it could have st been structured uh, differently, but um, I think what we have now with this book is a really rich base where Laura, Laura hopefully <laughs> can depart from uh, to go maybe and um, uh, into more detail at certain points. So maybe um, because I was thinking about it, it's very interesting. It would be so interesting to focus on one um, of the body knowledge is uh, one of the body strategies, like the uh, like the um, like flow, for example, and then look at flow through the time. And uh, I think that there's a potential. Um, you can, I, th I think there's you can write a whole book about flow through the time, but uh, um, this uh, there's a potential for future work. I think here to to pick out uh, certain things. And go more into detail, maybe, and um, and um, yeah, it's very interesting. But also, I think it couldn't it it needs to depart from an encompassing work, and then you can go into detail. So um, yeah, I see your your point, Beatrix. But um, um, yeah, I'm 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 looking forward to what Laura will do with this now, with this rich foundation for future work. Yeah. I'm not sure if I was misunderstood. I didn't suggest that you should do it, that Laura should do a comparative study. It was just that I thought in conclusion, um, maybe that's a question for now our, our, our discussion here. In conclusion, where would you, Laura, um, see um, similarities from the from your very particular field side, field research side, and other forms and types of yoga, or one could also say with uh, ways other kinds of Hindu texts are molded and transformed in discourse. Let's say the Bhagavad Gita, there's whatever ages of books and people wrote about the reception of the Bhagavad Gita, and it can be stretched in this and in that direction. And, there seems to be a similar development with this Yoga Sutra text. So one question I would have is, well, are there maybe other texts somewhere in the pipeline, which we haven't really recognized by now? Or um, could we use the, the analytic vocabulary to, to describe somatic experience? Could we use it in case of other types of postural yoga? And uh, in the sense of what we is it a useful, is it, is it used or, is it a useful tool which you want like to whatever spread in the modern yoga studies? So in that way, I thought in conclusion, or when you look back now, it would be my, nice to, to get some of your ideas. So that was basically what I meant to say. Can I answer? Yeah. Um, yeah. Completely, I know. I mean, Beatrix, when we talked to you already, told me the book is too big. <laughs> I know the book is too big. <laughs> I'm sorry for that. So um, I would have loved to um, make, they say, bigger conclusions, but, but I really also, I really wanted to be careful. Like what I did already, and I hope this will somehow highlight other research. I, I know some young scholars listening here that are doing research on lift philosophy. Um, you know who you are. <laughs> so um, it's not maybe related to the Yoga Sutra to Patanjali, but like lift philosophy as a part of modern yoga, for example, I think is a very broad phenomenon. And um, as far as I know, I am one of the first ones to kind of trying to look at it, to highlight it, to um, have an ethnographic study on that how is that um differentiating how is that um how, how what does it mean uh, lift philosophy for example and i think these um so i i have already been trying to make bigger claims for example contemporary yoga philosophy with six categories it comes from my data of course 
And now I'm hearing other people reading it and having their own data and relating to it. For example, synthesis, um, one category of contemporary yoga philosophy that I'm uh, is also a historical category um, where I'm showing that the Yoga Sutra has always been connected to other texts, for example. Um, Krishnamacharya connected it to Hatha Yoga contents. Today it's connected with mindfulness. Um, it is connected with other kind of parts of, um, with other thought systems, with um, the physical culture movement. Uh, Utony, for example, um, is a term from the physical culture movement that we find now in modern Yoga Sutra translations. So I try to kind of um, frame categories from my material and I hope they will be um, helpful for further research and I think um, there has been lots of Indological research and lots of research on um, maybe particular questions on um, ethnographic uh, research with particular questions but this um, philosophical I think it, it, it felt to me like a little no-go because yoga philosophy needs to be researched by Indologists which I do agree if we talk about the Patanjali Yoga Shastra but if we talk about something modern that came up which is a big part of modern yoga we need to find out how can we research that how can we talk about that with which categories can we try to frame that it is there how do we deal with it and i also for example i use veronique altla's work extensively and i use the work of um jacob schmidt which unfortunately cannot be read in english too it's just published about um cultural uh, mindfulness as a cultural practice and i use his um, um study historical study on mindfulness john kabat zinn and so on to enrich what i found out in my empirical research and i call it a mindfulness I don't know, um, um, Verachtsamung um, of yoga philosophy. So I go to kind of broader, um, let's say, conclusions. And also I talk about exotization. So we cannot have contemporary yoga philosophy without a certain view on um, ancient um, India, golden age, and so on. So I had to use, of course, other research um, like Veronique Alglas and Jakob Schmitz to come to bigger conclusions. And I really hope that what I did and I tried to do, and I, I do think that it, it was an experiment and something new, and it, it will just lead to more, um, that is more nuanced, more comparative, and yeah, that's what I hope. Thanks. Thank you so much, Sarah, for that response. And before we open to some fantastic questions that are coming up on the Slido, Dr. Moss, would you like to respond? I, I would have a, a, a brief uh, question to uh, Beatrix, uh, who um, seemed to be a little bit critical about uh, Laura's use of, uh, of diacritics in, in her work. And uh, I mean, I'm as, and as an endologist, are using diacritics uh, all the time and uh, for me it's a um, kind of neutral way of um, representing um, ancient Indian or even modern Indian scripts in an exact way without putting any ideological frame and I'm uh, the question I'm asking is not meant in any way to be provocative it's just an informative question how should I maybe also as an endologist uh, um, avoid the impression of um, putting myself in an authoritative um, position by using diacritics. What should we do? Should we use Indian scripts in the original, uh, even if that cannot be then uh, even approximated by, by a, a European reader? Or should we just use Latin script without any diacritics? So um, yeah, I would be grateful for your advice in this regard. Um, well, it's it's actually a topic. A topic I, I I often think about that myself in my own work because I know both. I know how to use diacritics, and I know that sometimes it's just easier or quicker not to use them. But um, my inspiration for these thoughts was actually this uh, this attempt to whatever or to explain that Guru English is a language of its own where certain four words in English have gained a new semantic um, whatever space. So terms change in the context where they are used. And um, 
I th I have no whatever solution in that sense, or it's not about political correctness, or you may not, or you should do, but um, I just thought that if one would um, um, use this term uh, Guru English and use it as a kind of Guru Sanskrit, just as a whatever label for a new way of dealing with Sanskrit words that are definitely distinct from anything in um, in Sanskrit English dictionary or so, because people deal very creatively with this, with this language, and um, um, so um, and I think that that's a whatever a way of cultural production by itself. It's not something anybody should be blamed for, but it's a part of um, whatever. If you go to somewhere and you do field research. You look for the specific jargon in this area. You try to learn their language. And for whatever, somebody trained in Indology, if you would go somewhere in, in, um, in, a, in a social site where people use Sanskrit words in a way you, I mean, you would always blame your students for using it in that way. But <laughs> if in a particular social site, people use it and develop it in this way. We have to whatever show in our descriptions of this whatever uh, linguistic culture, uh, we have to um, uh, indicate it in some way. So that is the only the thing I, I, I thought or the issue I thought about. I have no solution for this. Just I mean, uh, let's say if Laura would write an English essay, she could use the German words for it or whatever Germanized versions or maybe uh, also the, the, the Germanized accent in these words. I don't know if this is a solution. No, probably not. But um, uh, I think it's an interesting um, dynamic what happens with language and in particular with the language that is not commonly used uh, in the present days. Yeah, I, I fully agree. And uh, I mean, Sanskrit is uh, quite special because we have a uh, language change uh, in, its, in its long history, uh, dialects and uh, specific usage of a language, which in some way was uh, uh, accepted, uh, accepted from language change uh, because it was described by uh, early grammarians. So we, I think we, we have the, this phenomenon as well. We also have uh, certain uh, dialects of Sanskrit corresponding to certain ascetic circles. Uh, we have the uh, appropriation of the Sanskrit language by Buddhist authors uh, using it uh, uh, slightly deviating from, from grammar. So yeah, like frequently uh, in, in this field, um, we have uh, comparable phenomena already in pre-modern times, but the things get a special spin when we come to modernity, of course. Yeah, thank you. But one might even see it as a new kind of linguistic culture within Germany with uh, terms borrowed from Sanskrit. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was what I uh, wanted to say when I was talking about the invention of a private language, uh, actually, yeah. I could hear you, this is just so up my street. But I'm going to move things along a bit. So, Dr. Ashen Brenner, over to you, and then I'm going to ask Christopher Miller to ask his question. Yeah, just just very shortly to uh, to this discussion or uh, this debate between you two, uh, I just wanted to say, um, coming from an aesthetic approach, that this isn't so much a problem because text is always enacted. A word you write on a paper always stands for a discourse, always stands for multidimensionality, uh, for the enactment for, of the word. So it doesn't. If you declare it, it doesn't matter so much uh, um, what what the word is. Um, and I think La Laura does this in her work. She she shows us the multidimensionality. And um, yeah, I just wanted to point this out again. So thank you. <laughs> Thanks ever so much, Dr. Christopher Miller. I just muted you. I'm sorry. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, thanks, Ruth. Uh, thanks for the opportunity and congratulations, Laura. This has been a great panel. Uh, Laura, the question I have for you about your book is for the people who don't read German, are there any set of several or so key takeaways or points that you want us to take away from this that you think are worth remembering? And congratulations once again. Thank you. 
Hi, Chris. I'm happy that you're here. Thank you <laughs> for your question. Um, yeah, key takeaways. I mean, uh, okay, I I'm bad in doing things short. I try my best. First key takeaway is there is something that is, um, in my view, can be called contemporary yoga philosophy that developed over the last hundred years and is kind of blooming today. And um, I think in our researches as um, yoga scholars, as um, ethnographers, um, especially, we should uh, watch out for this phenomenon. And um, uh, this is one thing. The second point, and um, um, I'm sorry, I'm multitasking. I'm having the slide all open, and I'm seeing Lubomir's question, and maybe I can just, <laughs> I can just like slide that in because um, second point is of course when we we see as scholars a phenomenon like this. Um, uh, of course, we can look at where it came from and so on. There has already been synthesis, for example, in Krishnamacharya's approach to yoga philosophy, since uh, since synthesizing the Yoga Sutra with Hatha Yoga um, um, contents and so on. But when we look at what um, happens today, um, the synthesis is getting huge, broad, really um, kind of um, extensive. And then what is the critical aspect of that? What about cultural appropriation? If we want to really name that cultural production is one thing that Beatrix pointed out cultural production. It is a cultural production. It's happening. But I think especially in Germany, the question um, is how many people do um, that learn, your, for example, yoga philosophy and teacher trainings, how much do they know about the history of that and that there is a, a big cultural appropriation, an exotization aspect in this. And um, so really reflecting when we look at contemporary yoga philosophy, not only using this term and maybe decontextualizing it, it's something new, it's called cultural production but also what about cultural appropriation behind that is really uh, something that i want to also highlight in my research and then the last aspect and the biggest thing maybe that i tried to highlight um is that what is happening on a body level especially in spiritual practices like modern contemporary yoga is one um, which is so extensive so many experiences and so much um, let's say change on the body level this will change how people read for example texts that are associated with that practice so for example, that samadhi will be interpreted as flow, flow experiences are main experiences in the practice and so on. So if an ethnographer is just doing um, narrative interviews and finds out, oh, samadhi in my field is interpreted as flow, for example, it would be uh, good to look at the body level and to look, okay, what is happening in the practice? Are there flow experiences? What is a flow experience? And so on to kind of include this physical aspect and to somehow maybe thicken <laughs> thicken the description to um, use that common term um, of um, yeah um, this phenomenon of uh, contemporary yoga yeah thank you for that question okay, i hope you're going to talk about that sort of um the in embodied production of philosophy and the um the textual interpretation of embodiment and, and how you identify that kind of circularity. I think it's really fascinating. Thank you. Uh, Lubomir Ondraka, uh, you have a question. I know that Laura's responded to it a little bit, but I think you should go for it. Yes. Uh, yeah. Uh, good evening. Uh, uh, my question is rather rather general and it's to to Laura and per perhaps also to to other discussions uh, and it's on the, the classical I would call a classical problem uh, outsider insider problem uh, at the, what, what I mean at one hand we have this uh, Patanjali Yoga Shastra and uh, commentaries I mean the whole authentic Indian Patanjala yoga tradition in Sanskrit. On the other hand, we have this uh, yeah, Yoga Sutra, or as Philip said, somehow invented Yoga Sutra that's used in contemporary uh, yoga in modern modern yoga, uh, and this uh, this text as this work has uh, uh, different uh, different goals. It's set up in mostly in in, in Vedantic context, etc., etc. And my question is, uh, we as, as 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 scholars, as yoga scholars, how should we 
deal with 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 this so should we be just uh, uh, just uh, silent observers ethnographers uh, and uh, and to 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 just to, to note what's going on with this yoga sutra in modern yoga milieu or should we be somehow involved and to try to to present to to yoga practitioners the let's say real patanjali yoga shastra and by presenting or introducing this uh, this authentic text to in fact uh, deconstruct or destroy their uh, their idea uh, uh, about about the text uh, and my experience is i'm teaching uh, uh, yoga teachers for for more than a decade and uh, and uh, it's 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 interesting experience because first they are shocked you know if, they, if 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 you introduce to them the real patanjali yoga shastra they oh 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 this is patanjali yes it is patanjali and then mostly they they love it yeah that's fine but on the other hand uh, I, I am aware that I'm somehow, uh, somehow destroying or or being involved in 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 the contemporary on the on, on the modern modern tradition. So what 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 are your thoughts about about this uh, on this on this problem? Oh, such good questions. <laughs> yeah, a lot sorry. of things out there, and there's a lot of yoga practitioners here too. So yeah, yeah I yeah. do you teach on history and philosophy courses, and how do you present present Patanjali? Well, you use Philip Moss's work, but also like, is this kind of um, a sort of scholarly privilege here that we're speaking from? And and what is the real Patanjali? Surely there is no such thing, or maybe Philip Moss. Yeah. <laughs> I would love to hear uh, Philip Moss and other um, um, answers to this. I, I just take my privilege of having written that book to really um, answer to, to your question. Thank you for kind of naming the elephant in the room i mean it is a huge elephant that we some somehow deal with <laughs> and i know that like my whole work is talking about an elephant i mean i could have called it like <laughs> i could have named it like that i don't know um the thing is until now i think what what i faced is either there are ontologists talking in yoga studies talking about the yoga sutra and trying to really i mean as the impressive work that philip mars does i'm so happy that i have the insights that i would i mean i'm not reading the patanjali yoga shastra in sanskrit just uh, on my couch you know so i'm um, having this work that i can really enjoy and i can learn so much that's my take on the yoga sutra that i or patanjali yoga shastra that i enjoy most so we have this these scholars and then we have those ones observing um, and I see, okay, what's happening today? It's something very different. So these, so like kind of the the silent observer, um, just describing, and um, and then the 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 endologist maybe giving, also pro producing new input for yoga, for the yoga scene. I mean, we have to see that we as yoga scholars we produce knowledge, um, ever more in the last years. Um, that is really influencing yoga philosophy that in the field yeah so this is kind of and what I tried to do and I, I know it was a very difficult task to, to find the middle so I tried to I, I interviewed students I really wanted to know so what not only experts or indologists think about this text but it is now a lived tradition it is part of the religious a scene, the religious field in Germany. I call it a discursive element of European religious history since a hundred years, yoga philosophy. So this is a thing. <laughs> and um, I try to also see like, how is this lift a lift tradition today? And um, how is this even embodied and felt? And it's something that brings joy to them. I, I can agree. I was part of the teacher training. It brings joy to me. It kind of shrinked the joy when I realized the whole uh, exotization, orientalism and so on behind that. And I, I do think that this would students don't know. They would need to know more maybe about the Patanjali Yoga Shastra um, and more about how this contemporary yoga philosophy came to be. And then they can choose. They can say, well, I just want this, but I know that this is based on that. 
or I want to know more about the pattern issue, right? or I just skip it and I focus on another text <laughs> or just on my physical practice. So, but I do think that maybe with my work too, these questions will be raised and will be somehow, yeah, talked about. So yeah. uh, I hope some, maybe Philip or other have something to say about our oh, Lubomir, thanks. And I completely yeah. agree, Laura. <laughs> what you said absolutely yeah so uh, indology is not not the end of the story it's uh, one component uh, that can provide some useful knowledge and an interdisciplinary approach to modern religion uh, cannot end with uh, indological stories uh, 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 studies that's that's completely clear and uh, i also agree that we should enable people uh, to inform themselves um, about according to their own interests and uh, to empower them to make up their own mind. Uh, that, that's uh, what we are, that's also kind of responsibility that we are having as uh, academics um, in, a, in our societies. Thank you, Philip. Lena and Beatrix, did you want to jump in on that question at all? We, we, we actually have quite a few questions remaining in the slide. Oh, my cat's making loads of noise. And often we finish our events at course pass. So may I just check in with Laura and the other panelists that you're happy to take some more questions and maybe go to at least half past if you have thumbs up from Laura and it's her gig. So we're going to keep going. I'm going to read out the next question, which links to what we've just been discussing because it's an anonymous one. Do contemporary yoga students, students interact in terms of embodiment, that is, with other canonical, in inverted commas, yogic texts in a similar way as they do with the Yoga Sutra? Um, in terms of embodiment, um, I see all, all the listeners are already fully multidimensional. <laughs> I'm happy. <laughs> so yeah, as I, I like, I highlighted two times already, and this is not um, the only um, aspect of contemporary yoga philosophy that I um, that I name. But this synthesis of contemporary yoga philosophy is based on. Bhagavad Gita, um, Yoga Sutra, Hatha Yoga texts intermingling. So of course, um, um, contents of the Hatha Yoga texts like Bandhas, I mean, they are part of Ashtanga Yoga. We find them in Hatha Yoga texts. And of course, they, there is a modern interpretation, for example, to hold them during dynamic practice and so on. So there is, of course, in terms of embodiment and engagement with other texts, <laughs> with, of course, mainly Hatha Yoga contents in this yoga Yoga Sutra way, um, it's special. Um, I because there are no real embodied practices in that to be found in their text. This is a difference. So we don't have something like bandhas that we then just can trace back to a Hatha Yoga text to the Dathadreya Yoga Shastra or whatever. But um, you know, I didn't see that in my field would happen the same with the Bhagavad Gita or, or anything or other texts. But I do see that new texts, for example, like the Dattatreya Yoga Shastra, are now in my field being practiced. So there is, it is somehow this um, um, wish or this um, yeah, focus on, on practicing um, text-based old knowledge seemed to also go on to other texts that are now provided also by Indology, for, by Indologists, for example. So that's an interesting um, factor that seems to be coming up um, and yeah. I, I, yeah, I, I had a really interesting observation from listening to Patab Joyce Patabi Joyce uh, teach in Mysore, in that he's called his system of yoga Ashtanga Yoga, yet he was teaching Hatha principles, Hatha Yoga principles um, were the topic of his sort of weekly addresses. Anyway, Jacqueline Hargreaves, Hargreaves hello, over to you. I just saw her, where is she gone? Ah, thank Hi, thank you, just unmuted me again, thank you. And thank you, Laura and the panelists, it's been fantastic to be able to join in live and Laura I will be one of those people that will be Google translating each page of your forthcoming book so thank you very much it's been wonderful to see it come to fruition so my question is about you speak about this um, body driven interpretations of textual knowledge um, coming from your ideas of sort of um, body driven spirituality so I had a question regarding how do you, within your research, disentangle 
body-driven interpretations from transcultural or localized interpretations of textual knowledge. So some of those things that you're speaking about, how textual knowledge is interpreted within the Ashtanga Yoga community that may be either German or transnational uh, versus um, ideas that you're seeing as interpretations that are specifically around this um, aesthetic idea. Thank you. Thanks, Jackie. It's nice to see you. Um, I'm just still not sure. I read your question before, but I'm not sure if I understand. Do you mean that um, in, let's say, are there similar embodiments of textual knowledge across different cultures in the Ashtanga yoga scene, for example? No. Ah, thank you, I've been unmuted again. Um, no, it's more about your methodology, really, because you, you sort of say that you've um, approached one aspect of your um, research is interpreting how people are um, experiencing the texts uh, through an embodied uh, practice. And I just wondered whether it's possible to disentangle that from what might be considered cultural interpretations or localized specific interpretations um or are you saying that they're 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 always bodily because they're being interpreted through a person i think it's more it's more of a methodological question really i see um I, I hope i can answer this i mean um the body is always cultural so there is nothing but a a, a body that is not um uh, fully how's a good word in English, um, geprägt, um, structured by culture. So um, these are like bodily, like say embodied approaches to a text are always cultural approaches to a text. And then, I mean, I do think that there is a special German um uh, embodiment of the yoga sutra for example and um i would be very interested for example euteny um this um, balanced muscle tone or to knee having a good tone it is a concept um th that is thoroughly if you if you google it sutra 2.46 in the internet it's euteny that a balanced state muscular state is the first hit maybe not anymore but when i did the research it was so um and euteny is a concept that was coined in the 1950s by a german um phys physical culturalist who came out of a line of physical culturalist um uh, jacques del Cro del Cros is his name and um so I, it might be that this embodiment of sutra 246 as a balanced state might not be in other cultures because it comes from the German culture. I don't know, but we see, of course, like a globalized middle class um, doing this kind of modern yoga and also this modern yoga and new sutra interpretations. And this is highly networked, um, uh, global network. So yeah, maybe there is a, a broader tendency to that. Um, I don't know if I fully answered your question, but that's all I can say to that. <laughs> Okay, good. You got a thumbs up. Uh, Nick Lawler, University of Lancaster. Can you um yes, hi. Hi, I, I I can't see you now, but just thanks again, Laura. It's been a fascinating presentation and all the panelists. It's been such an interesting conversation. So I had this question about, I mean, I think the work that you have done around contemporary yoga philosophy and defining that is just fascinating. And I had a question around whether or not your research participants were able to kind of define ontologically what they mean by an embodied divinity and whether there's any kind of common understanding around that or whether in fact it's a very diffuse field thanks nick hi i see you nice to see you <laughs> thanks for listening and also for reading my article nick is a bit informed about my my research already um so 
Yeah, this embodied divinity that Beatrix highlighted, um, it is, it was actually um, part of only of one um, part of my field, um, especially Ronald Steiner, and he um, based this on um, alignment principles. So usually alignment principles are not part of Ash Ashtanga Yoga as it was taught by Patabi Joyce. Um, that is um, what I found out um, in my interviews and um, with senior teachers of Patabi Joyce. So this alignment aspect of really kind of um, tuning the body into a very aligned state um, is in, in my, uh, according to my knowledge, something new to Ashtanga Yoga. And this was discursively um, connected to divinity. For example, I have in my research data, um, something like um, if you align your body, you will also align with the divine, for example. So alignment um, means mm, it is very thought as a very physical um, activity uh, than this embodied divinity, and um, it somehow it is related to perfect to perfectionism. It is related to perfectionate the body in the end, which 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 has a history in yoga. <laughs> I mean, it had it, yeah, you know, in hatha yoga, for example. Um, but in a very different way, of course, and then um, a, a lot of topics come in here into the divine perfect body of, um, uh, of course, neoliberalism and so on. We all uh, have a lot of um, topics coming up when we hear all of this, but that was what was kind of, I, I would not say ontologically, I would say amicably came up um, right. when it came to that topic. But many other senior teachers I interviewed did not have that take on Ashtanga Yoga at all at the practice. Thanks, Nick. Thank you. Thanks, Nick, and thanks for your response, Clara. So we have a few questions remaining in the Slido that are all anonymous. I'm not quite sure what to do. I could just read them all out and you could pick whether there's any aspects that you would like to respond on, or we are towards the end of time. Um, um, I'm, I'm sure Laura is available to uh, communicate with for anybody in our current audience or who might be watching this later on YouTube. Um, well, while I'm talking, Laura, you, you scan it and see if there's any, as you're on the slide, oh, scan it and see yeah. if there's anything you want to pick up. And I think that the last point there about the power of yoga is perhaps picking up on Philip Mars's um, concluding comments. Uh, Shall I, and, and there was a point as well about Shirat Ji, who is the current lineage holder of Ashtanga Yoga, and um, the, perhaps he could try to uh, keep Sanjali Yoga as authentic as it can be and give Ashtanga back its roots. And I think that question really points to questions around authenticity and um, the, the difficulty of, of, of what, is, what is true Ashtanga, what is true Patanjali, um, and I hope that you will be taking and others will be taking this research forward in terms of looking at these different um, historical contexts of, 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 and of what yoga is. <laughs> and I mean, um, I suppose personally, I'd like to say that I hope that the rigor that you have taken to your research is, is applied by you and others to some of these, to, to the questions of abuse that have occurred in Ashtanga Yoga. And um, I think that some of the techniques that you have been using in your analysis, such as tattooing, such as, yeah, um, would serve to do a very interesting and helpful, I hope, um, analysis of a difficult topic. Um, Laura, were there any final concluding comments that you would like to make before I draw this session to a close? Um, yeah, I mean, first of all, I'm, I'm very happy that I, I just got so much time uh, with uh, so um, brilliant scholars and um, many other um, highly interested and also involved people into this topic and um, got so much time to talk about my research. It was a, a, a dear pleasure. And um, I think, yeah, it is a um, phenomenon that I researched that um, kind of, I think it will now jump in the eye of, of many researchers, maybe it did before, it wasn't framed. Um, and I hope it this will just continue just for yoga um, 
scholars for practitioners i mean i am a scholar practitioner i started my journey practicing yoga um 20 years ago maybe and um I like I encourage everyone who is dealing with terms like yoga philosophy, for example, to really dig a bit deeper and to see like where does it come from? Um, what can we do with that? How can we can we just blindly live it, or should we look at the tradition behind a little bit and then make choices, for example? So this was because I I include a lot of practitioners' views and I see that this is a highly um, also needed thing somehow to have something like what yoga philosophy takes over today these ethics and um, this framework of talking about um, one's own worldview and to to have a text to kind of discuss things among each other and so on so I, I actually do think um, this is a, a needed framework for for our society somehow but to think how, how can we how can we frame that well as a yoga community what do we do with this M might be some some things that I would like to maybe um yeah just tell practitioners and um yeah um, yeah I, I i think that's it and um whoever can read my book in german it would be just try to read it in full <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> it's lots of work but um yeah and then whoever has questions please just write to me and um i'm happy to for to uh, um, um yeah dive into conversations thank you well on behalf of the center of yoga studies i would like to thank laura von ostrowski again um for presenting her book through the Center of Yoga Studies and to congratulate her on the publication for Monograph. And I would particularly like to thank the discussants who um, put in a lot of time and effort and um, uh, presented their beautiful analysis to us, which um, uh, led to such a rich discussion. So thanks ever so much, Philip Moss, Nina Aschenbrenner and Beatrix Hazard.